Well, welcome, guys. We're going to go ahead and get started. So thanks for coming. My name is Gordon Cooper. I'm a product marketing manager here at NXP. And my responsibility is high-end microcontrollers. And many of our high-end microcontrollers have, have a graphic LCD interface. So what we're going to talk about is how do you add an embedded, um, in an embedded design, graphic LCD interface. And I have with me... Hi, I'm Chris Stoker, and I work for Future Designs. Uh, we do a lot of touchscreen development and off-the-shelf GUI modules that can be designed into production products. Yeah. So one of the products that they've created is based on our microcontroller, the 4088. So this is an embedded design. Just a little preview here. It actually has, in an embedded design, you can actually do video, which is pretty atypical. And in, in the video, it's actually more of a, like a motion JPEG, but it'll talk more about that in detail. So this is what we're talking about. So if you wanted to add a, a user interface, here's some steps, and this is more or less our agenda. So you have to decide, do I really need it? Do I need a graphic LCD interface? Why would I use it? There's segment LCDs you might want to use. If you do, what are some of the considerations in terms of resolution and performance? This is kind of an overview. Some of you might know, know this. We'll go through it as quickly as we need to. Then you choose an LCD panel, and there's some consider considerations. Obviously, there's a lot of panel makers here that you can go and walk and ask them questions. And then you have a couple ways to get started. I'll talk about if you wanted to start with a micro. Maybe you've used NXP micros before and you want to start there, and we'll talk about some considerations and how you would choose that micro. Another way to, to get started is actually choosing an existing micro and LCD pairing, such as this Muse kit from FDI. And so Chris will talk in more details about that and then go on to talk about graphic packages. Um, and then you have a decision. How much of the programming do you want to do versus maybe farm out some of the programming? And how easy or hard is it to use this graphic package to create your own graphics? And then mass produce your product. And Chris will finish with that. So, Okay, so why, why do you want a, a color LCD? And I think the answer is that's the trend. Everybody has a smartphone now. Everybody has a color display. Everybody's used to cap sense touching. So it, it certainly seems the trend. So to have a, a segment display, if you're creating a project, a product, doesn't differentiate you in, the, in, a, in a positive light. So adding this color display, how do you do it economically? Now you can go to a high-end Cortex-A microprocessor and go do it, but in a lot of embedded designs, you don't need that level of performance to get color display and to get um, touch and some other things. So at a lower price point in embedded space, you can add color displays, and that's what we'll talk about here in this session. Okay, some things that make it easier to add graphic LCD capabilities in an embedded space. The cost of color LCDs are coming down, which is a big um, benefit to add these now in the embedded space. Microcontrollers are getting faster. They're starting to embed graphic LCDs, and we'll talk about the 4088 as an example of that. We have free software packages, as do other vendors, that make it easier. We have board support packages that make it really easy for you to get started. And there's a lot of off-the-shelf boards, this, this being one of them, but there's other boards as well that you can get started with. Um, schematics and other things are available if you wanted to, to make it your life easier. It's amazing the places that we see. We've, we've had microcontrollers with graphic LDs, LCDs for a few years now. It's amazing the different applications. So it's not just one space. It's not consumer. It's not um, specifically medical or industrial or, or um, white goods. So we see it almost everywhere. And as you have your design, either, either you want the user interface or you want to convey information to your customer. So we see this in a lot of different places. Medical as well, blood glucose meter. You might want a nice little graphic touch screen. So a lot of different applications that you can see these. The resolution you typically see in the embedded space are the 320 to 200 CGA all the way up to XGA, 1024 by 768. I would say typically 800 by 600 is more a typical resolution you would see in the embedded space. But we do see um, some that go a little bit higher. Now, it's important to say that this is not full frame video, right? If you want full frame video and video compression, you're probably going to look at a, at a higher end Cortex-A processor. But the things you can do with these very low price points in the embedded space, as we saw in the, in the opening, you can do some clever tricks that FDI has figured out and they can show you to make it look like you're seeing full motion video, where in fact it's what, 15 frames per, 15 frames per second? No. Okay, so performance needs. What do I need in terms of resolution? You really start 
not with the size of your screen. You don't want to say, well, I want a seven inch. You start with what's my resolution because a seven inch screen could have different resolution sizes. These are all typical standards that you tend to find in, in displays that are out there. So as you walk around, you more easily find one of these. And as I was mentioning in the embedded space, all of these resolutions will be sort, supported by the graphic LCD controller that we're talking about. So it depends on what you want. Now, the trade-off, of course, is the bigger it is, the better it looks, but the more bandwidth I need. The more horsepower I need my micro to, to pump through, either through the external bus or just the sheer processing. Smaller, I can probably do a lot more in terms of frames per second of video, but of course it's smaller. So there's some trade-offs. It depends what you need for your design on what size you might want. This is actually a um, 480 by 272, I think, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of in, the, uh, in this space here. So you can see that they go up quite large. You can go, this is more like a seven inch panel up here in this, in this space. So you get a pretty good size in the embedded space. Once you determine the resolution, and, and then typically the resolution will lead you to an approximate size in inches, you have to know about color depth. How many colors for every pixel? Now typically, you probably want to look in the 16 bits per pixel space. And I know 555 looks like it's 15, but in fact, the, there's an extra bit for intensity there. So typically in the bedded space, you probably want to look at 16 bits per pixel. We can support up to 24, which is even better color, but of course you need a lot more horsepower, a lot more external bus spins to make that happen. So again, your footprint of your micro gets a little bit bigger because the more bits per pixel, the more external lines you're gonna need. So there's some trade-offs there as well. You probably don't wanna go down into, well, eight, eight's probably not bad. It depends on how fancy you want your color to look. And you certainly don't wanna go down to four or two or one. That's monochrome and one. So the sweet spot I would say in the embedded space is 16 bits per pixel. So if you know your resolution, and you know your bits per pixel, you can do a little bit of math dividing by uh, you know, bits per byte, and you can figure out, well, how big do I need my frame buffer to be? How big is one frame or one image on my screen? So you multiply your resolution, you multiply your, your um, bits per pixel, you divide by eight for bytes per bit, and you can figure out how many bytes you need. So just as an example, using this display, if I do my uh, 480 by 270, times 16 divided by eight, I'm gonna get 261,000 bytes that I need to store one frame of data. You're probably not gonna find a micro, not an unexpected micro, with that much RAM internally to store your frame. So you're gonna to have to look at external memory. So in almost all cases, our customers will go with external SD RAM and choose one of our micros. If we have an LCD on there, we probably have an external bus as well. So you can hook up external SD RAM and store your data in it. So what you need then is a micro with the graphic LCD interface and the external, uh, external bus as well, and which we'll talk about in, in more detail. So now I know the size uh, roughly. I mean, you might double buffer, right? Maybe you need twice as much. Um, I know roughly a starting point of memory that I need. Now, what about bandwidth? So the bandwidth through the external bus. If you're using one of our micros, we give you this handy dandy Excel file, which is a little bandwidth calculator. And you can plug in some, some calculations to figure out What's my refresh rate, my bits per, um, per pixel, my LCD resolution, which we just talked about, and then a little bit of latency for your SDRAM, which I said you'd probably need. External bus, you might have a 16-bit or 32-bit external bus, so there's some choices there. And you plug all those in, and you can figure out, well, what's my, what's my utilization of the external bus or the bandwidth? And in this case, it comes out to be about 16% using a 32-bit bus and, and the 4088 um, in this design. So that leaves you a lot of bandwidth left over to do other things in your, in your system. So once you've kind of figured out, you say, okay, can I do all the things I want to do on this micro or not? And I think in this case, we're in pretty good shape. So choosing an LCD, I can't, I can't promise you that I can give you the exact right fit because everybody's going to have a different need for LCD panel. I can give you a few things in the embedded space. So SCN versus TFT. The trend has certainly gone toward TFT in terms of displays. So you most likely would be looking at a TFT display. This is a TFT display, right? Faster response time, better colors, wider viewing angle, also good reasons. Uh, really the only reason to look at STN is lower cost and lower power. There may be application needs where that's a better fit, but 
serial versus parallel LCD interface. You could, of course, on the SPI bus, connect up an LCD panel that has a controller built into the LCD panel. Now, if, you're, if you're, SPI is pretty fast, so you could use that and it's a lower cost solution. You don't need the graphic LCD, you can have a smaller pin package. The trade-off, of course, is you're not gonna get the bandwidth that you would get in a parallel interface. But it is something to consider. So if you look at some of our low-end, we have a new LPC11U6X part. There's a board that has a, a little color display on it and there's no graphic display, it's just communicating via SPI. So in the low end, you can still get an inexpensive way to, to add graphic LCD without having to have the LCD controller. But we're going to assume that you want the extra bandwidth, maybe the, the 15 frames per second video, et cetera, and you want a little bit more performance. So we're going to look at a, one of our parts with the embedded LCD uh, interface of the controller. So we talked about two ways. One is you can start with a micro, and we'll talk about some micro selection. There's a seat up front, by the way, if anybody is interested. And then we also talk about a second way, as Ken said, you can actually start with a partner who's put the system together and already has some, um, in this case, the Muse GUI, already has a software framework for you to work with. So two different options. So if you wanted to start from a micro point of view, if you're not familiar with our microcontroller family, this is actually an image right out of our, our brochure for the most part. NXP focuses on ARM 32-bit micros. We're very focused on the Cortex-M family as well. So as you look at this kind of spectrum, here's the M0s, M0 pluses on the low end, M3s and M4s on the, on the high end. And the performance ranges from you know, 33 to 50 megahertz up to 204 megahertz. So kind of a spectrum of microcontrollers to choose from. You might use, if you want an LCD, you'd use the SPI interface here, but if you want the performance, you're up here on the higher performance microcontrollers with a graphic LCD. Not everyone has a graphic LCD, not every one of these, but we'll talk about which ones do. Our high-end M3 family, the 1700 and 1800, and our M4 family, the 4000 and 4300, have this graphic LCD. It's the same IP block, so in any code that was done for one of them would actually work on any of them. So as you look at all our demos and examples, if you see one of the other ones, it shouldn't be very hard to move it over. Um, particularly these two are nearly identical. We just switch cores out and these two are nearly identical. We have some older legacy ARM7 parts and ARM9 parts that, uh, that have the same LCD. We have some customers still using those. But for a new design, I would certainly recommend looking up here. And the way to differentiate here is you need 120, 120 megahertz or do you want 180 to 204 megahertz uh, higher memory, one mega flash, high-speed USB, some other performance things to choose from. We're going to talk about the 4088, which happens to be an M4, 120 megahertz. And so all the things that you'll be able to see on this, you know, 15 frames per second video, et cetera, we can do on a 120 megahertz processor. The graphic LCD, and as I mentioned, you need to add ST-RAM. So we have the external memory controller as well. Um, having 512K of flash allows you to do a lot of programming, a lot of uh, code in there. And have anybody heard of our spy flash interface, Spiffy? No? Spiffy is kind of a cool interface. I'm, 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 uh, yeah, I'm the marketing guy, but I think it's kind of unique. It's unique to NXP. If, are you familiar with Quad Spy? So spy flash is, you know, single line. Quad spy, same eight pin package, now you have four lines, basically. So you have four lines of data that you can connect to. We make that four lines of data, or this peripheral does, look like 32 bits of memory map. So you can actually treat it as if it's part of your memory map and just read and write from it on the 32 bit microcontroller. So think of this as being an accelerator and you can actually, as you're reading flash, if you're reading sequentially or if you're programming code, it runs actually really fast compared to what you would expect with four bits. You can actually use the spy flash interface to store tables or images or a lot of things in a very low cost memory off chip and ex ex execute from it or just access it as you need to. So it's an easy way to add a lot of flash to your system. So you can buy 512K of flash or if you only need a little bit of internal fast flash, you can go external with a larger, you know, larger amount of flash. ADCs, all the things you'd expect in a micro, CAN, USB, Ethernet, SD card, etc. 1700 has been around a little longer, so you might see a lot of examples with the 178X. So it's a good one to look at, and, and that code will run on the, on the 4000 as well. This is a graphic LCD. 
So we, although we can support SCN and TFT, you're going to want probably to go with TFT. We support up to 1024 by 768, but you might not need that much resolution. And again, this is um, 480 by 272 as an example. There's a lot of examples of 800 by 600 and other, other examples that uh, our third parties have and we have demos of. DMA support's important. Um, adjustable color resolution is important. It happens that you can offload cursor support, which helps offload the core. So this is unique. This is, sorry, consistent across all of our micros with the graphic LCD. This actually is the connections that you would have. You can see your micro. Here's your external SDRAM on the external bus. You don't actually need the NOR flash anymore because you've got the spiffy flash, which can be much larger. But they're both on this board, and one of the videos that are kind of built into this shows you performance comparisons of the two. So it's kind of nice to see that this actually performs faster, even though it's only four bits, than executing or reading from the parallel NOR flash. So here's our LCD connector, uh, micro SD card, JTAG for debugging, et cetera. So this is just an example block diagram for you of how the micro is hooked up with the LCD. So from a microcontroller point of view, if you wanted to get started, we actually have two websites that are worth knowing about. NXP.com, of course, has all our documentation. There's some videos. So if you go to NXP, LPC Zone, technical support, you can go here and ask questions of our apps guys. And then on LPCware.com is an NXP site that is an engineer to engineer site. So code examples, schematics, um, our, our software downloads are all available on that site. So good to know from a uh, reference point of view. All right, so that's an overview of, of LCDs and resolution and an overview of our micros with the LCD. But let's actually talk now. Well, I'm going to turn it over to, to Chris to talk about, all right, if I wanted to partner with somebody who's already gotten started with this combination, what are the, some of the things that they will offer? Okay, one of the things we've been working on for the last several years is our <coughs> Muse GUI family, which offers multiple processor options, including the LPC 1788 and the LPC 4088. And we support various screen sizes from 